Uh, this is the second visit to the radio program. Last time he was here, he had a, a new book just published, but he's had several books. But we're not even going to go how many it is. Um, anyway, he's back with us again because he is speaking at the Eastside Irish American Club today. Rowan, welcome back. Hi, Sherry. Good to be <clears throat> Now, your name? Yes. Rowan. Yes. Could you explain it? Um, it's an exceptionally old name. There's about seven St. Rowans in the early Celtic Church. So long before our great friends in England adopted names, either forenames or surnames, uh, we had patronyms for thousands of years, so I'm an O'Donnell. And that means that someone of my name lived in a particular part of Ireland thousands <coughs> of years ago, the oldest <coughs> names in the Western world. And our Christian names are a bit different. What defined you was your bloodline and your place and your status in society, which would become fixed. So I, I have someone called Donal, uh, O'Donnell in the old days in Turconnell on the borders of Donegal and indeed Derry. In my, what your Christian name, however, was something a bit like what we understand to be traditions in Native American culture, whereby it reflect something to do with your character expectations. They tend to be about fighting, uh, chief, chieftain status, ownership of, of assets, namely dogs or cattle or things that define you as someone of merit. So my name is derived from a very old Irish phrase. The literal meaning which is not the real meaning, is red one or even little red one. There's a diminutive there, the on, right? Mm -hmm. But in actuality, it's about fighting. It's to do with a Celtic mist or a blood mist. The red is not about hair, it's about blood. So it's to do with a, a warrior status. Okay. Okay. But you mentioned Donald O'Donnell. He's a judge, isn't he? A, a high court judge, or a, isn't he? I w it wouldn't surprise me. He is. He was here for St. Patrick's Day, right, Terry? Yes. That's right. Don't know that. I don't know him personally. Yeah. Um, I thought you might be. I right did late. know the late uh, J Justice Adrian Hardiman, uh, yeah. uh, who's, who's a no stranger to the Cleveland. Uh, he right. was a very interesting right. uh, litigator. Uh, talk to me about uh, today. You're going to be speaking at the Eastside IA. That's the main reason. Are you mm -hmm. on tour, or did you just come in specifically for today? Well, that's a very good question. I am. I get the odd invitation and the year that's in it, since I specialise in Irish political history, is obviously a hugely important year. Mm -hmm. It's 100 years since the, great, the rising of Easter in 1916, which of course is Easter moves around on the 24th of April. In this particular instance, I did a number of events in New York City and its environs uh, to do with a new thing called the Kula NYC event, which is the first annual um, cultural event. Susan McKeown is the curator and the, I suppose the manager of that event. So she had me do a number of things in New York City, including speaking on a, spoke, uh, on a soapbox in Union Square, uh, a la James Connolly, which is quite an experience. And I did two talks in the function room of Ohlone's, and I also spoke at the very prestigious and old <coughs> um, uh, American Irish Historical Society. Uh, it's an organization that has links to John Devoy himself, uh, Justice Daniel Cohalan, and others who feature in the, the size big events in the 1910s and 20s. Did you ever speak at that place in London, the corner in London? What's it Hyde called? Hyde Park. Hyde Park. Did you ever speak there? Did you ever no, jump up on the stone? No, the because with the type of thing I want to say, I'd be arrested. So <laughs> it, it would not be prudent <laughs> to advocate the Queen uh, Irish would democracy. Have you personally arrested? Probably. Well, I, I'd be guilty of treason because, I, I, as someone who is a constitutional republican and wants Ireland to be a thirty-two county a democratic Irish republic, that would that would contravene their laws and their their customs. But, but all kinds of people say all kinds of weird, crazy things. There. But I'm not weird or crazy. <laughs> oh, I know that's true. That's true. But objectionable things, should I say, to the crown? The people do say all kinds. And God bless them, but the, the, they do that in their own but country. But you've never done that. Though. No, but I'm an Irishman. I won't go. To, I won't go there to complain to people in their own country. Oh, okay. In their own country. No, okay. it wouldn't be appropriate. Yeah, that's, um, um, let's talk about uh, your job. You're a professor of history at Limerick University. Exactly. And uh, is that that's your full-time job? You work yes, there uh, uh, six months, eight months out of the year? I work there every day of the year, no, including when I'm on. not there. No, there's no history professor works every day of the year. Come I'm on. going. I'm going back to. I'm going back from Cleveland to Shannon Airport mm -hmm. on the on the 24th, arriving the 25th, which is my wife's birthday, and I'm going that evening to attend a function which I need to go to from the airport, and then following day I'm starting teaching for three weeks in the summer school that I direct and teach on and, and founded. So. It's not. It's not just the four I'm curious, or six months. Well, I'm curious about this because my father was a school teacher and he taught history, mm -hmm. but he taught uh, his version of history. We had two books when we were in school, and you're too young to remember this. There was one published by John Carty, and then there was one published by John Casserly. 
And my father used to always say, he says, Casualty is not the history of Ireland at all, even though they wrote about the same events. Uh, Casualty, he said, had slanted towards the English version. Jack Carty was the Irish version. When you teach history, has it got any yeah. slant to it? Because I know you have the, Repu mm -hmm. you have the Republican point yeah. of view, very strong. Do you, well, how do you teach it? Well, I'm an empiricist. I'm interested in evidence. I mentioned extrapolating uh, reasonable arguments from the known facts mm -hmm. and marshalling new facts, in other words, from the historical record. Um, I'm not a propagandist. Uh, there's a reason why this book, for instance, has got notes. I wrote a recent book on Irish Republican prisoners in England that are 4,000 footnotes, none of which were anonymized, even though they included interviews of people admitting to offences that are not covered with statute of limitations. So I'm not messing around. Um, I, I, I am at the forefront of a movement to have more appropriate, factually based historical analysis in our society, which you, your father's generation we were not allowed to have due to the strictures of post-colonialism and our own lack of confidence as a new nation. Mm, well, he was born in 1903, of course, he lived through the 1916 rebellion, mm. and then he went on and became a school teacher in the, in the late 20s. Uh, but he was, he was very emphatic that Irish history was the way that John Carty wrote it in his history book. Jerry, your father was operating in a post-Civil War environment. That's true. And if you were to highlight some of the ideas of the 1916 proclamation in 1923 onwards, you are risking not just your career, but your life. Mm -hmm. uh, in 22-23, 77 Irish Republicans were executed by the government of the Free State, the 26 counties. 15,000 Republicans, particularly for the problems of Munster, were driven into exile in the United States of America. I'm damn sure many of them landed up here in Cleveland. Um, it was not safe to discuss the truth in Ireland in the 1920s. But, but the, the Republican version was the truth, though. Well, you see, I, I hear what you're saying, and I, and I know what you're trying to get to, but I would just say there's the factual version. There's one that's predicated on what actually happened, who did what to whom and when. And that's enough. I'm not someone who believes we can psychoanalyze the dead. I, had, I wrote a book about Patrick Pierce. I have no idea what Pierce actually thought about anything and anyone who says they do is a fool, a liar, or both. We do not know the dead. What we can do is say what they did, when they did it, if we can recover those uh, facts from the historical record, and we can adduce certain interpretations to a, in a limited manner of what their intent was. And that's it. Any new information on uh, Pierce that hasn't been published before? Did you come up with anything new? Jerry, I've never, I would never engage in cheap mercenary uh, cash-in uh, synthesis. If I didn't write a book that was new, I, I just don't do it. This particular book, no, I'm not trying to sell it, I don't want anyone to buy it. I would hope that the major libraries here would obtain it and anyone wants to read it can do so. I hope someone pirates it. Don't tell the publisher I said that. I have no problem with people reading it. I have no problem with someone getting it in Kindle and being made available mm -hmm. in a thousand formats. It's 90% it's based on sources that were withheld from me in my lifetime until I was in my 40s, which are now available online to anyone who wants them. I downloaded more than 400 personal depositions of people who fought with Pierce or interacted with Pierce, and that's what I based my book on. It's new, uh, pristine, primary source information. Uh, can you talk about uh, Pierce's visit to New York? Pierce um, is an extremely significant figure. He's someone who'd been talent spotted by the great Tom Clark and Sean McDermott, um, both of them spent many years in the United States. The McDermott family are still re represented in the greater New York area. Clark was a US citizen when John Devoy sent her back to Ireland to represent the interests of Clan, Clan de Gael, in other words the Fina Brotherhood, in their interaction with the sister organization, the Irish Republican Brotherhood. The most significant person brought into the inner circle by Clark was Patrick Pierce. Uh, when um, they founded Ogden Heron, a.k.a. The, the Irish Volunteers, a.k.a. the Irish Republican Army, when they are active service. Pierce was the first man they sent to the United States to garner support for what they called euphemistically the Equipment Fund. Mm. The Equipment Fund was nothing to do with going on your holidays with tents, believe you me. It was about the wherewithal uh, of modern warfare. Pierce uh, spent a number of months in this country. He toured extensively in the East Coast. He actually overstayed his original um, projected tour uh, he, was in, he was in Delaware, he was in Rhode Island, he was down in Philadelphia with Joe McGarrity, another key figure along with Devoy and Keating in Chicago, and Pierce was the man who personified the new Republican generation. And now, uh, the people that he interacted with in New York City, is, are there any of those 
Uh, we say the descendants of those, the fathers or the mothers of those people alive today that you have made contact with? Well, that's a good question, but I can tell you this. Um, one of the most significant persons who's not very well known in either the US or Ireland is Justice Daniel Cohallan, who's an Irish American judge, right? And Cohallan went to Ireland in 1913 where he met Pierce during the seismic lockout labor protest led by James Larkin who in 1916 was living in Chicago uh, as basically an, an Irish exile in the United States. Uh, Pierce interacted with Cahalan and his papers uh, are voluminous and they're extant in the American Irish Historical Society on Fifth Avenue. So whilst the, some of the families are definitely still here, yes they are, but so are perhaps more importantly the operative papers of, of their illustrious uh, ancestors. Have you been able to make any contact with any of those people? I've met a number of people. In, in my recent trip, I met the grandson, I think it was the grandson, I hope that one's wrong, of Ca Captain Robert Monteith. And Ro Monteith was an Irishman, despite that rather exotic name, um, who was sent by the clan and the IRB to Germany to keep an eye on what Roger Casement was doing uh, in wartime basically to supply the Irish revolutionaries with German <coughs> firearms. Now Monteith had a background in County Wicklow, <coughs> where I lived for many years, and his family are predominantly located here. He was on the run under pain of death, because when he came back to Ireland he did it via U-boat, which is a rather uh, strange way of uh, travelling. Wasn't there a walk last week in New York or other places that Pierce visited? I think somebody told me that. Maybe it was John Garvey in New York told me that there was a walk around all the places that Pierce visited or knew very well. Did you know anything about that? I don't, but I can tell you this, that would be a very long walk. Mm -hmm. That would be from Brooklyn, it would be from Queens, the far reaches of Queens. Well, it was led, it was led by the Consul General. I, I wasn't last, there. Last two weeks, well, maybe just two weeks ago. We're going to come back and talk some more. We're going to talk about your book. Okay. See where people can get it. But I hope you want to sell it. Governor, <laughs> professor of history at uh, Limerick University and also an author. And uh, Sometime political pundit and opinion. Uh, you have an, uh, a strong opinion on the way the country has been run, or, or do you want to get into that or even more concentrate on the book right now? Well, we, ju we just had an election, and the Irish electorate clearly are a bit confused by the way the country <laughs> has been run and should be run. It took more than, what is it, 70 days to form a government? Yeah, this is the yeah. first time, and two centre right parties who have never had any truck with each other are now sharing power. Uh, as the Chinese it's say, very it's very interesting unusual. times. Very, would it last? I don't see would how it possibly could. Years, I, no. I, I'd be very surprised very because you have a strong opposition, you have a lot of independence, we have serious issues uh, you know, afflicting our economy and our, and our immediate future. And all these things are going to create tension. And I, these are not natural bedfellows, so I think there'll be internal dissension. However, one great thing about it is 5.6% GDP. That is phenomenal, isn't it? But Jerry, we have several hundred thousand young Irish people in Western Australia, in the Bronx, in Canada. Yeah. And some of them should be there and make a better life for themselves, and others do not want to be there. Yeah. And when they come back, Ireland is still a too high tax economy, low wage, high tax, and that is not conducive for making a family life uh, embedded in society in a productive manner. So many of them are not coming back. After they've done their time in Canada, they're going to places like the UK for the first time since the 1980s. Okay. And Australia, of course, the beneficiary, huge beneficiary. Hundreds of thousands of Irish in Australia. We're, we're welcome and we don't have some of the legal restrictions that the, the US government for its own interests, which one respects, have imposed on migrants from our part of the world. Okay. Uh, let's talk about your book. The name of the book is Patrick Pierce. Patrick Pierce by Ruin O'Donnell. Where can people buy it now? The right. easiest way in this country, and um, if you can't make it down to the club later on, is to Amazon, I says. I'd probably. Uh, Amazon. And, uh, yeah. uh, you will be at the Eastside Irish American Club today. What time is it at? I believe it's four o'clock. Four. It's three, it's three o'clock. Three o'clock. Right. Three o'clock at the Eastside Irish American Club. And the address of the Eastside Irish American Club is 22770 Lakeshore Boulevard in Euclid, Ohio. So you should be able to find it. Great big building. If you've never been there before, I know there'll be a lot of people going there because just to meet you and talk to you. That'd be great. Uh, about your book. Uh, could I go back to the, the research again? So I'm so yes. interested in how you did all this yeah. research on the book. And you've written a few other books also. How do you find the time to do all of this? Now, what's the last book you wrote before this? How long ago was it? I've written a book since that. Oh. But, but it's edited, so mm. it hardly even counts. Yeah. But so how long did the research take on this one? 
Well, that's a hard question to answer because I work on projects over a period of years. So I garner materials, but the writing process can be quick. Um, I'm, I'm reluctant to say this, but I will say it. I would have written, I would have spent about eight weeks writing that book. I had to write it under a bit of pressure, at deadlines. I don't think it's gone in my life. My father was in a hospice. My mother was not in a good situation. And uh, there's other issues that the, the vicissitudes of modern life and the human condition. So I, I had to get it done. But I knew what I wanted to say, and I had marshaled my sources and I'm pretty good on terms of where things fit. Did you uh, did you give some thought to this a few years ago? You knew the 100th anniversary was coming up yes. and you thought it would be a suitable time to bring the book out. Myself and Lorcan Collins, my uh, co-general editor of the series, the 16 Live series for O'Brien Press, conceived the basic concept with Michael O'Brien and the late Mary Webb, a senior editor in O'Brien Press. And we decided what, what the tenor of the, of the entire uh, series would be. So we, the old the old joke is about runner beans. You know, d dig the trench four years ago. How do you get those runner beans? Dig the trench four years ago, and we did. About four or five years ago, at this stage, we we mapped out what it would look like. And at that point, it was the most ambitious publishing project of the entire decade of commemorations, which in Ireland is the term given for the whole period from around about 1912 through to 1922. Now the decade is actually more than 10 years. It's, it's going to it's going to leach into 23, 24. Um, but we did the early planning and we conceived what it would look like, what the readability level would be, what the length would be, and more importantly, who would write the books. Okay. Uh, did you find any interaction anywhere between De Valera and Patrick Pierce? Any conversations, any, any uh, correspondence between them? Well, De Valera was one of the, the four battalion level commandants in Dublin City in the Irish Volunteers, Oakland Heron. And born in New York, so sure. he could be claimed by this country if they want him. His mother is buried That's in Rochester. That's his life, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, he's an Irish American. Uh, well, well, yes and no. Yes and no. Um, if you want to talk about that, I'd say this. Um, what saved De Valera was the roster of the executions. He was far down the list of those the British wanted to shoot. When I say the British, I mean General Sir John Maxwell, a.k.a. Butcher Maxwell. Now, he's not called that in England, but he was called that in a temporary Irish society. He was reined in by his own Prime Minister, who personally tasked him to knock heads in Dublin. It looks like, it looks like Maxwell wanted to execute around about 200 people. They did sentence 90 to death. They shot 14 in Dublin before they changed their mind in London and said, hang on a second, this is counterproductive. They shot one Thomas Kent in Cork and they hanged Casement in Pentonville Prison in London on the 3rd of August 1916 after a show trial in London. A show trial. Yeah. Stalinist type show trial. Uh, but this could have been much more extensive. They arrested three and a half thousand people. They sent hundreds of Irish people to a concentration camp in Wales, Frangoch. And it was a concentration camp. The British invented this. They perfected it during the Boer War when they managed to kill tens of thousands of men, women, and children who, who were of the families fighting their, their invasion of the Trans and the Orange Free State. So we should talk honestly about these things. There's no reason for anyone to be upset about it, but we shouldn't allow obfuscation and romanticism and you know rose-tinted uh, retrospective glasses to stop us speaking the truth. What I'm saying is factually correct. There's no discussion. I'm not wrong. I'm right. Uh, but please check me out, challenge me, have a look at the sources, and tell me I'm wrong, yeah. because that is the learning process. All right, let's go back to De Valera. Did you find any correspondence, any kind of interaction? Well, what I, what and I, was, I also yes, want to ask right. you about, um, mm -hmm. also about Michael Collins, because those were yeah. two people that were very prominent after the rebellion. So talk to me about those two. Well, you put your finger on it there. Uh, De Valera's status largely derived from the fact that being the, the only significant commandant not shot by the British, he, he rose from being a mid-level figure, and he was not a significant figure. Well, he was quite significant, it's all relative, but he became artificially significant by virtue of status. There's a second reason for that. His sector included the Mount Street Bridge area, where the Sherwood Foresters ran into 12 volunteers under Michael Malone, and effectively under De Valera's overall command, where they, they encountered bloody mayhem due to bad officership. And the victory at Mount Street Bridge was something that uh, was militarily impressive. Uh, in this country, the people responsible, four of whom were killed, uh, would have received it. something like the Congressional Medal of Honor for their, for their valor in defeating vastly superior forces. You had 12 men holding off literally thousands. Um, this was a big deal. 
uh, the Sherwood Foresters and the South Staffordshires were then moved to the, the north side of the city where they committed the atrocities in North King Street when again uh, encountering heavy resistance by the IRA as they were called in 1916 they, they murdered in cold blood around about 20 civilians, burying them in their cellars in the back gardens and then lied about it. Um, the British are not being exactly uh, forthright about that to this very day. But atrocities happen in war and fighting in built up areas is very difficult, the British are not trained in it, there's issues. But De Valera got the credit, rightly so, for some of the tactics and strategies that, that uh, led to that victory. But he was not a terribly significant figure. Moreover, and this is very significant, he was not a significant figure in the Irish Republican Brotherhood. Unlike Michael Collins. Michael Collins had been the head centre in London. He was aide de camp to Joseph Mary Plunkett in 1916. He was attached to the headquarters staff of the GPO and played a, a valorous part in the retreat to the Moore Street uh, Terrace, uh, right behind the GPO in the centre of Dublin City, where the last stand of the leadership element of the rising took place. Collins's conduct in 1916 um, impressed many people, and this, this laid the basis for a status within the reorganised IRA in 1917. He was a guerrilla uh, specialist, wasn't he? People like Michael Collins, um, people like Tom Barry, um, Carl Brewer developed guerrilla warfare as we understand it, and in the urban sense and in the rural environment. Ireland has always had the, the unenviable task of pioneering modes of resistance. It is not something you boast about. This is a sign of national distress, but under the exigencies of the times, uh, the Irish are very good at resisting imperial tyranny. Rowan, I want to come back and talk to you about what would have been so different if the British had not executed those, okay. those people. I just wonder, I often wonder about that, I want to talk to you about okay. that. Separation of church and state, separation of judiciary from, from state interference. That was vastly more sophisticated than anything in Western Europe. But still, the uh, when the rebels went out to fight, they were taunted by the population of Dublin. No, that's, that is that true Jerry, or not? That's absolutely untrue. It's not true, right? You see, you, you have to bear in mind that this occurred against the backdrop of the so-called Great War, the First World War, that yeah. seismic slaughter of working men from all over Western Europe who died for nothing except for the ambitions of the imperialist overlords. It was an unmitigated disaster that destroyed the Russian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the British Empire. They all tumbled. It led to the creation of the United States as a major power, so I suppose there's some good came out of it, but not, not in any way one would want to rise from a, a low power to a major power, as happened on this side of the Atlantic. They were not booed. They were, they were also cheered, but under wartime censorship, with something presented as a pro-German riot by British lies in London, which, which even Asquith and other administrators admitted on the record of the House of Commons in the aftermath, they misrepresented to the American people. Right? So uh, Pierce and his comrades were not pro-German, were they? Certainly not. No, but the they, British did say they were. Well, the British, the British in the 1950s were imprisoning uh, President Obama's grandfather in a concentration camp in Kenya and torturing him. So we don't take moral lessons from them. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Kenya. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's get back to 1916. What about? Um, Plunkett, Joseph Mary Plunkett, and, and a yes. lot of the people like him, these were not soldiers, they weren't military people at all. How, how was Pierce able to convince them? And Pierce himself wasn't a military man either, he was a school teacher, right? Connolly, maybe? Yes, ex he, he was ex-imperial forces um, in the British Army. How were, they able, how were they able to convince these people, or did they even need convincing people like, um, like Plunkett to join the, the group? They didn't need it because they were part of a generation that believed that Ireland should be a democratic republic and should determine its own destiny, have its own government in our own country, and dispense with some of the legal nonsense that the British want to impose on their own people and on ours. In other words, we want to be more like America, more like France. That's what we wanted, nothing more. Uh, those who fought in 1916, if you allow me a minute here, did not want to take anyone's property, their country, culture, or language or to impose anything on anyone apart from raising them from the status of subjects to citizens. That's what they fought for. And this is why they are worth commemorating, they are worth admiring, in my opinion. And I'm not going to pretend, as you asked me earlier, that I don't admire those who fought for those democratic impulses, because that is my makeup, right? And I do admire them. And those who fought against them were on the wrong side of history. They were negative, sectarian, imperialist. They're the enemy. And we do not have to celebrate our enemy. 
We don't have to demonize them, but let's not, let's not pretend we're all on the same page here. There's right and wrong. People like Pierce were right, and the British force in Ireland were wrong. So all, you know, all they wanted was independence from Britain. That's it. Well, they did want that, but they wanted a type of society that would be tolerable for the ordinary people. Uh, in other words, they want to emancipate the Irish people uh, from the, the thrall in which they've been subjected to by English militarism. Do you think there's a lot of British influence still in Ireland today? Well, there always is. I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is... Get rid of years, well, it? we're never going to. And we don't, we don't have to worry about that. We, we, we can be reconciled to this thing because the British are no longer, to, to some extent, our enemies. There's the unresolved issue of the partition of Ireland and their selfish deceit against us in Ireland. So the legacies of that are a problem, but they are being addressed by various means. And that is, in, in the short term, better than before, when they were not being. I mean, we're all of a generation that remembers the long war, 1968 to 1998, the longest deployment of the British Army in its history. That was not a good time. However, we do have cultural bonds to the British uh, that are significant, and in the context of national reconciliation and international friendship, they will always be part of us and we are part of them. I want to ask you about the, uh, the Brexit that's taking place soon, the, the vote that's coming up. Yes. And there's, uh, I was reading in an article the other day that said that this could actually bring the border back. Now, we we'll want to address that. How can that happen? Well, what you're talking about is a popular vote that the British Prime Minister David Cameron felt obliged to concede to fend off a, a, an equivalent of a Tea Party type struggle from the right wing of his own party. The, the, the issue there is that the English do not have any constitutional right to a referendum to change the constitution, uh, unlike Ireland, where it's, it's, it's required under legislation. It, it's partly to the fact that the British do not have a constitution and no bit of rights. But that's their business. What they want to do in their country is, is up to them, although I don't think it's wise, and, and I think it's rather illiberal and, and anti-modern. If they vote to leave the European Union, it will be a hostile exit, and much will depend on how Brussels and Berlin and the instruments of the European Union respond to that. If they do so with a, a selfish interest, in other words, to, to penalize the British for undermining the economy of the European Union, then their economy will collapse, pure and simple. But in the short term, Ireland will be the most maximally exposed because we are uh, economically and culturally tied to them with an open border even beyond the Schengen Agreement of Free Movement of People, which is a European uh, instrument, a EU instrument, to a way that uh, give, makes us a special case whether we want to be or not. Unfortunately, we have what's nominally an international border. If, if the UK leaves it and the Scots don't want to leave, this will le almost certainly hasten their pathway to national self-determination as well. The Welsh probably won't be able to do much in the short term. In theory, uh, the now invisible border, but nonetheless pernicious concept in, in my country, could be hardened because the 26 counties of Ireland, what's called the Republic of Ireland, could be seen as the back door to the UK. But that's the worst case scenario. I think it's very unlikely that anyone in the right mind would wish to harden up that particular borderland. You start building a wall there, all hell will break loose. Well, um, the, uh, the general opinion is, though, that this thing is not going to pass anyway. The Brexit will not take place. Well, they said that about the Scottish vote as well. And when the Scottish vote was mooted, uh, the, the mainstream media were saying maybe 22, 23 percent. It, it, at one point, it got very close to parity. And in Glasgow, it passed. The, the voters in Glasgow, the most significant settlement in, in Scotland, voted in favour of independence. It was a year run thing. Now, Public mores can change, issues will, 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 will adapt to the context of the times, of course. That's the normal part of, of political life in all our countries. But believe you me, depending on the turnout, if there's a high turnout of the disaffected youth in England who have not been, in my opinion, properly educated in the strategic issues pertaining to this vote, they will leave. And this will hurt them. They'll shoot themselves in the foot, but they will leave. Ron O'Donnell. See him today at the Eastside Irish American Club, 227 Sandy Lakeshore Boulevard in Euclid. If you want to call out there, it's 216-731-4003. You're going on at 3 o'clock. Mm -hmm. 3 o'clock today, and the lecture lasts for how long? About six hours. <laughs> yeah, six hours. You enjoy every minute right, of it. Right. You're going to love this guy. Get some questions for him, yeah. and you will get some and answers. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let's just switch over. Ruin O'Donnell, great to have you back with us, and yes, I sir. hope the book sells a million. I know you don't care. <laughs>
<laughs> I hope people read it. They're that's, that's idealists. They're an idealist. How, uh, I'll have to go on Amazon and get it, I guess. Please do. No, uh, yeah, you don't have a trunk, uh, your car, your trunk of the car full, do you? I actually do, but Tom, um, we can Tom, talk later. <laughs> Tom, um, or, I mean, Dan uh, Danny Cogran, he always says, you can come to the trunk of my car for that's my right. books. That's that's right. Right. Keep some more in the car. Um, today at the East Side IA. It's going to be a great day, and you're going to cover a lot of different subjects. I will do, yeah. I, I've got to talk about the U.S. dimension as well. Okay, that's that's very important, I think. So I hope everybody gets there. Uh, the telephone number out there is 216-731-4003, and the address is 227-70 Lakeshore Boulevard in Euclid. And you can go into your GPS, and I think you can pick that up. 227-70 Lakeshore Boulevard, Euclid, Ohio. You're going to have, you're going to really walk away from this. I, I don't know if I should call it a lecture or a talk, but you will be more informed about what went on in 1916 and the, the, the American uh, dimension also. That's right. All right, thanks, Ron. Thank you. And thanks for the...